Proverbs chapter 6, beginning in verse 20. God shares this with us. My son, keep your father's commands. Do not forsake your mother's teaching. Bind them always on your heart. Fasten them around your neck. And when you walk, they'll guide you. When you sleep, they'll watch over you. And when you awake, they'll speak to you. For this command is a lamp, and this teaching is a light. And correction and instruction are the way to life. Amen? Drop the mic. You see, in this series, I want to welcome to our summer series called Drop the Mic. And I want to, like Jason said, I want to say happy Father's Day to all of you. Now, as I was listening to him saying he's eating hot dogs today, listen, I hope my family loves me more than just hot dogs. I don't know if they're listening right now. I want more than hot dogs today on Father's Day. Anybody with me? But now as we're here today and gathered in this place, welcome to our Stafford campus. Welcome to those watching us online. Uh, we want this to be a moment for us just to have uh, as we lean in on Father's Day weekend, but also in this series called Drop the Mic. Now, y'all know where I got that Drop the Mic title. Listen, we, we teach in series here and we title series because we know it gives people a handle a handle of, of invitation to say, hey, we're in this series, you wanna come, we want you to come and join us. But what I love is oftentimes when I meet people that have been with us for maybe a year or more and ask them, hey, when did you first start coming to the church? They usually refer to the series that they first showed up on. And I love that. I can't wait to a year down the road asking somebody, when did you come? They said, oh, during the Drop the Mic series. But drop the mic actually is a phrase that got coined in the 80s. Come on, any 80s out there? And it came with rap battles and it came with comedians that would have that drop the mic moment to symbolize triumph or victory, right? This idea of I got the last word, boom, drop the mic, walk away. And so when I was looking and reading and studying through Proverbs, it's like King Solomon, this guy that asked for one thing, wisdom, God gave it to him, and he has these wisdom bombs that he just drops again and again and again all throughout Proverbs. That I thought, man, that's catchy. Let's, let's just go to Proverbs and let's lean in on the sermons, drop the mic. And so today we're going to lean on one that I think is good for parenting and specifically Father's Day for fatherhood. Who gets the last word on fatherhood? And we're going to let God say some things to us today in it. Now, to kind of give you a little bit of context, because you might be new here today or you might be new to the Bible today, I want you to kind of hear some context to help us to understand how we get these words drawn out to us. Now, in this idea of hearing the words being drawn out to us, uh, I want you to know the author of this book is a guy named Solomon. Now, if you know anything about the Bible, the Bible's divided in two parts, Old Testament, New Testament. The Old Testament is the story about God's people called Israel. Israel looks around and they see every nation has king. We want a king. And they start asking God, God, give us a king. God, give us a king. God says, you don't need a king. I am your king. I'll rule over you. They said, no, we want to be like all the other countries. Give us a king, God. And so God finally allows it, and he allows them to get a king. The first king of Israel, his name is Saul, King Saul. Now, what normally happens is after the king passes away, somebody in his bloodline will become the next king, right? But not Saul. God handpicks somebody else before Saul even passes away, he picks this unlikely kid, this kid of eight children, the youngest, a shepherd boy working out in the fields. God picks this kid named David. And David becomes the second king of Israel. And then sure enough, when David departs, they anoint the next king, and it happens to be David's son, Solomon. And that's where we're picking up today. Solomon, King Solomon, is the writer of this book that we're studying called Proverbs. Now, to give you a little bit more context, I want to give you some contrast. And, and it doesn't take long to see that Solomon is very different than his father, David. Some good, some not so good. But let me give you some distinctives here so you can see the differences between these two men. You see, Solomon was a scholar, not a soldier. You see... He was a man more interested in building buildings than fighting battles. David enjoyed the simple life of being a shepherd, while Solomon enjoyed the luxury of the palace. 
David was a shepherd who loved to serve God's flock. While Solomon became a celebrity and he used people to support his gain, his extravagant lifestyle. David was a warrior and he put his trust in God. And Solomon, who asked for wisdom, he over time put his own trust in his own wisdom. And more of like a politician, he put his trust in earthly authorities and treaties and achievement. And although Solomon became the wisest man asking God for wisdom, his life, I believe, becomes a great example. That wisdom isn't just what you know, it's how you live. Are are y'all with me on Father's Day today? Listen, wisdom is not, it's it's one thing to know what you need to do, it's another thing to actually do it. And, and, And what I want you to see is that when David, King David passes away, the people cry and mourn. When Solomon passes away, the people beg for relent and release. Isn't that interesting? Two different men, two different kind of missions, if you will, and leading this out. So can we just commit to doing something today, right here in week three of this? Can we commit to not just being people that are hearing great wisdom out of the word of God, but can we be equally committed to living it out the next seven days? Come on, are you with me? And, and as we commit to doing that, can I tell you some good news? We get something that they didn't have in the Old Testament. We, we get the Holy Spirit. Come on, that's good news today, everybody. We get the Holy Spirit that empowers us to live this truth out. So let's hear the truth, learn the truth, and let's live the truth. Now, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Proverbs again. Let's look at verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 20 again. Now, the book of Proverbs... What I love and appreciate about it, it is all about practical words for our life. Practical instructions, and there's a whole lot in this book about people skills. Now, if if we could ever... If we could ever use something in modern day times, we need to get better at people skills. Come on, can I get a witness today? We need to get better at how to talk, how to listen, how to interact with people. And what I love about Proverbs, there's a lot of truth in here about how to uh, grow in our own human relationships. So there's, there's instruction in here about marriage and about family, about living in neighborhoods, about going to work in our jobs, and even about how to widen the circle and have better friendships. I'm going to preach that in about four weeks from now. And so if we learn to, to live by God's wisdom that's presented right here in Proverbs, we're going to not only improve our people skills, we're going to actually enjoy our lives that much more. Come on, is that something good to sell today? You could get better in your life and in your relationships. But to understand this, is to understand a little bit more about the context of who Solomon is writing to and what's going on. So let me tell you something about Jewish culture. In Jewish culture, in family and parenting, I want you to see something here, that the Jewish husband and the Jewish mom, they actually saw children as a gift. They saw that as a gift and a blessing in their life. Matter of fact, listen to Psalms. Stay there in Proverbs, but listen to Psalms. Psalm 127 verse 3 says, the children are a heritage from the Lord, an offspring, a reward from him. Come on. Children are a reward, not a punishment. Children are an opportunity, not an obstacle. This is how they viewed children. Come on. Can you get there today, families? Well, today I want to talk about not just parenting. I want to talk to fathers in the room. Do I got any fathers here today? Come on, come on, come on. I want to talk to my fathers here today. And I want to share you the last word about fatherhood. And and so as we lean in today on this idea of parenting and fatherhood, let me go ahead and give you a parenting goal that I believe the Bible has for us. Spoken out of Solomon's mouth, but deeply supported by God. Here's the parenting goal. Here we go. To help our kids make what? Wise decisions. Come on, parents, to help our kids make wise decisions, right? Isn't that really our goal? That's what the goal of of Solomon when he's writing these words, but that is what we're up against. But to give you some maybe some other examples of what we're living in in our modern day times, let me give you some examples of what we do find in our modern day parenting. How many of you have ever met the helicopter parent? Any takers on that one? 
Come on, what's a helicopter? It's the parent that hovers, 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 and doesn't let their kid get free. And they're watching, I gotta protect my kid, protect my baby, my baby girl, my baby boy, right? I'm gonna protect, I'm gonna watch, and I'm gonna try to control everything about their lives, right? That's called what? A helicopter parent. Can I tell you, that's not what's prescribed here in scripture. Anybody got a helicopter parent in their life? Woo, yes. Oh, kids, put your hands down. <laughs> Don't give that up. Yeah, that's too easy, man. But she's cut out. Confession, I like that, I like that. Now, let me give you another type of parent. You might not know this parent, but it's the karaoke parent. What is that, Pastor? Well, here it is. We all know that parent that's trying way too hard to be way too cool. Can, can I just go ahead and tell you, once you became a mom and a dad, you lost cool card, right? You are no longer cool. So it don't matter how hard you try, how much you want to try to dress and talk and fit in, you're just not that. We don't need a karaoke parent, right? That's not what the Bible wants for us. Anybody taking that one yet? Right, right, right. All right, here we go. Another one. Dry cleaner parent. What is that? What do you do to dry cleaner? You drop off clothes and you come back a few days later and you what? You pick it up. We live in a culture that wants to drop our kids at school, drop our kids at sports, drop our kids at dance, drop our kids at church, and fix my kid while they're there. And I want to drop them all off, and I just want to pick it all back up. Come on, dry cleaner parent. Listen, I know you're defining your life by all the stuff that you involve your kid in, but you know what? Your kid might need more than all this extra activities that you're dropping them to. So just a thought there, that's not what Solomon wants for us. Here we go. How about the volcano parent? Ooh. Ooh, yeah. This is the parent that, that, that always responds with emotion, right? It's like, Bwah! And usually it's the, it's the most simple, minor, not that big of a deal, not essential that sets it all off. And man, not only is the volcano blowing up, it's, it's got lava flowing everywhere, right? Come on, you know a parent like that? Come on, who grew up under a parent like that? Listen, oh man, I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand. <laughs> Woo, not fair, not fair, not fair. All right, I got one more for you. Come on, military crowd, you'll like this one. The, oh no, I'm sorry, I got one for that. Groupie parent. Now this one might be interesting, but out of all six bad examples, this actually might be the one that's grading the most traction in modern day time. What this is, is when as parents... We make our kid the center of everything in our universe. And we worship our kid. And my kid's the greatest. My kid is the best thing since sliced bread. My kid can do no wrong. My kid, my kid, my kid. And you know what? Oftentimes we think by putting our kid at the center, we're helping them when actually we're crippling them. Not only can that not be sustained in their life, it's not a stage they can last on very long. And I'm telling you, this idea of making your kid the center is not what God wanted for your family. And then the last one, come on, military guys, men and women. It's the commando parent. I heard the who ah. This is the parent that's all about the rules and little on the relationship side. Listen, I'm not saying families shouldn't have boundaries and rules, absolutely. But when rules are all about what's most important and rules over or maybe even despite a relationship, not good long term. Not good, not good, not good. Come on, can I, can I, can I tell you these six examples are kind of big, kind of broad painting with a broad brush so we can actually be a little disarmed and laugh a little bit. But how many of us can at least say, oh, that's kind of like the home I grew up in, right? How many of us can go, is that really our home? I hope not, I hope not, I hope not. Can I tell you right now, this isn't what God is speaking into us when Solomon writes these words in Proverbs chapter six. And so right now what I want us to do, there is another way, good news, there is another way to be a parent, there's another way to fatherhood. And I'm gonna tell you this, it's not a new way. It's actually an ancient way. It's a timeless way. It's a biblical way. So with all that, let me reread what I just spoke over you, and let's unpack this a little bit today. Here we go, Proverbs 6. Look at this again, verse, beginning of verse 20. My son, keep your father's commands and do not forsake your mother's teachings. Bind them as always on your heart. Fasten them around your neck. And then it says, when you walk, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will speak to you. For this command 
is a lamp. I love it. This teaching, look at this word. This teaching is a light and correction and instruction are the way to life. Come on, parents. There's another way. There's another way. Can I tell you this other way? It's the way of being a light. That's what the scripture is saying. It's to be a light. To be a lighthouse is what God's calling you and I to be. Now let's just think about this idea of a lighthouse. This idea of a lighthouse is it's a steady structure kind of out on this far, far point. It's a steady structure that shines a light to why? To be able to give direction to lead someone safely home. It's this idea of a steady structure that's so key and so significant here. So today, in the few minutes that I have, I want to share with you right here are these three words that Solomon gives us here. I want us to see three ways to shine. Now listen, you might be sitting here today and going, listen, I, I'm not a dad today. And if this is all just for dads, I'll just check out and we'll go have lunch later. Hot dogs at Jason Windsor's, right? But listen, if you're here today and you lead anybody, if you're here today and you're a business owner and you're an employer and you have people under you that are responsible, listen, I think there's some truth here that can apply. But I do think these words are written to family. And I want us to lean in because God has something here. I want you to get more out of this Sunday than bacon. Are you, are you with me? Hey, because God has something for us. So how do we shine? How do we shine? How do we shine? Well, right here it uses the word teach. And I'm going to add this to it right now, note takers. Number one, we got to teach by example. Teach by example. Something key here. Listen, unlike the helicopter parent that's hovering, 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 trying to control. Listen, the lighthouse is strong and steady. It gives the child direction. And then it gives the child room to grow. I think that's really key, to let the child have room to grow. And then it gives that child someone to look to as an example to find their way forward and to find their way home. Parents, we are called to teach by example. And what I know about the ancient culture, and this is going to be just mind-blowing here today, is that in ancient Jewish culture, the reason this verse starts the way it does, and if you read Proverbs, a chapter day like you, some of you have been doing, you're going to see my son, my son, my son in several chapters, right? But I want you to see something because it says my son, and it says something about the father's commands, and then it says something about the mother's teachings. Because you know what? In ancient Jewish culture, they actually believed this. They believed the father and the mother were the authority of the family. I know that's not the culture we live in today, but isn't it interesting that they said, this is what we believe to be true, that the father and the mother are the ones who set the authority for the family. Come on, not the kids. Come on, not the neighbors, the Joneses that we're trying to, not the culture. The family is led by mom and dad. Mind blowing. And I want us to see something like that in such a stark way because there's something here that Solomon's pointing out. Because see, truth in their day wasn't just what you said you believed, it's how you actually lived that made the difference. Why? Because you teach by example. And then he goes on, he talks about this idea of tying it on. It's the tie that binds, right? These truths are the tie that binds. And then he gives some teachable moments, right? When you lie down, when you wake up, when you're awake, when you're walking around the road. Hey, you know what he's doing right there? He is, he is showing us that he actually read the scriptures too. This is important for us to see. Because see, before there was Solomon, there was David. Before there was David, there was Saul. And before there was Saul, way back in the story, there was a leader in Israel named Moses. Moses gives us the first five books, right, called the Torah. The Torah, God's commands, right? The Torah. And in this word of the Torah, in there, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, he gives this call to the family called the Shema. I'm doing some teaching here. Go with me for a second here. Come on. If you've been here before, you've heard me talk about the Shema. Matter of fact, to show me your wake, say that word with me. Shema. Say it again. Shema. shema, Shema. And the idea of the Shema is this. Hear, O Israel... The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. 
Moses says to the people, these commandments that I give you today, come on moms and dads, are to be on your hearts. And then as parents, you're gonna impress them. What's important to you, what's important to God, what's important to you is now gonna be important to your kids. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, uh uh-oh, when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. That sounds like what Solomon's referring to. And then he says, tie them as symbols on your hands, bind them on your foreheads, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. You see, Solomon's truth is rooted in a bigger truth. It's a story that God wants for family. And see, we gotta teach, we gotta teach, we gotta teach by example. This is so important to see. Now, fathers, on a day like this and hearing a message like this, this is when the enemy is tapping on our shoulders, pastor included, and says, oh, yeah, father, what kind of example are you? And I'll be honest with you, I I know what it's like when I hear these words talking about living by example and wondering how, how, how do I live up? I might even say it this way, come on, come on, are you smoking what you're selling, dad? That's a bad illustration. That (laughs) promotes drug use. Are you practicing what you preach, Dad? Maybe that's better, that's better, that's better, right? Or or as Benjamin Franklin would said, your best sermon is your what? Is your example. Your best sermon, actually, your example is your best sermon. And to me, it isn't really what you do, the loudest of what you do. But, but guys, come on. It, it's hard. It is hard in this world to, to be faithful. It's hard to do everything right. It's hard to, to know that you are the example before your kids. I know what that pressure is like as a father, this feeling of trying to be perfect. And even the weight of that can be defeating. But can I tell you, the more perfect example for your kids might be how you show your kids how to handle a mistake. Man, listen, this is how, this is how real time this has been. I, I know sometimes when I get up here, I'll share you know, stories to try to get us connected to what maybe truth we're leaning in on. And a lot of times I put myself out there and a lot of times I put my own kids out there. And, and y'all may be sitting there sometimes going, ooh, he just said that about his daughter. Oh, he just mentioned his wife that way. Oh, and I, and I know you're probably in those moments going, oh, bless his heart. He's going to have a rough time. And, and listen, if my kids get mad at me, I just say, well, stop giving me material, right? <laughs> you know, do the right thing and you won't show up on Sunday, right? And, and, and even in that, I, I can be honest with you here. Like I said, I can tidy it all up. And on Sunday, by the time I get to Sunday, I can share it in a way where you can have some fun with it because we're removed from it. But if I gave you the backstory of things that happened, Listen, right now, listen, I I know as I share, because I like to be real, right now we've wrecked some vehicles. And listen, even as I say that out loud and try to have some fun with it, listen, do you know that when a kid drives a vehicle, what's possible? Praise God, we're not dealing with physical injuries and what's happened recently, because that's real. That's real right here for our county. And so I don't mean to make light of that, but I'm trying to show where maybe we're not physically hurt financially. Woo, we're in a new day figuring things out. And even as we try to figure these things out, I would love to say boldly, man, I'm pure when I'm giving my kid those speeches about driving and driving right and correct. But can I tell you, the emotion's not always pure. The reaction's not always tame. The words aren't always beneficial. And I'll be honest with you, there's some speeches that my kids said, I wish I could get up here on Sunday and have the microphone, dad. I might really finish that story, dad. You know what I'm talking about? Can I be real today with y'all? So here we are having all these moments, come on, multiple cars down, trying to figure it all out, right? I got a driveway now because we got some new vehicles. I got a driveway of five cars and I have been blessed and relegated to driving the minivan. (laughs) That's a sermon for a whole nother day. But so here I am on Thursday. Y'all know Thursday, it was raining. I had an early meeting. I was leaving the house about 5.30 that morning. It was raining. I luckily, because you know, you're always jockeying who's going to be on the back of the driveway, who can get out, and you know, oh, you're behind me, oh, I got to move a car now, that kind of stuff. But I happen to be the back car, so I'm going, okay, yeah, I can get out. So I get into my minivan, right? And I, I get in there, and I'm looking back because my kids have clipped our mailbox so many times. I mean, can they? And so I'm watching the mailbox all of a sudden crunch. I ran right back into my daughter's Jeep. 
Yeah, in that moment, I'm thinking, all of a sudden, all those speeches <laughs> that I've been giving my kids about safe driving, and anytime you reverse the car, you got to look, you got to look, you got to look, and all of a sudden, I'm hearing myself, and I'm hating myself, and I just said, I just got to go to work, and I just drove, I just drove, I drove. I didn't stop, I didn't pass go, I didn't collect 200, I just got to work. Now, this is where it gets even harder to say this out loud to you guys, but when I got to work, you know what the first thing came to my mind? I'm going to get online and figure out how to order that lens, that brake light -like lens, and I'm going to fix this bad boy before they ever know anything else. <laughs> Isn't, that, that bad? Isn't that bad? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to fix this. And they're never going to be able to point their finger at dad. Right? And in that moment, praise God for the Holy Spirit that dwells in me. I heard I got to teach by example. So instead, I go outside, rain stop, and I take a picture of the back of the broken lens, and I send it in our family text message, fam bam. And I send it, and I say, look at what dad did today. I made a mistake backing up. I did exactly what I've been telling you guys not to do, and now I got to own what I've done here. Do you know that, that the hardest thing for us to do, dads, is to teach from humility? But it's probably some of the best things that we'll do when we are willing to own that we don't always get it right either. Listen to me. Look what the word says. Look what the word says because this is so significant to understanding this. It says this. It says for this command. Come on. This command is a lamp. A lamp. This teaching is a Light. Can I tell you, when we teach by examples, we provide a beacon for others to follow. And that's what we got to begin to see. Are you living a life worth following? All right, note takers, number two, write this down. Loving correction. Now, right there in the text, it says, for this command is a lamp, this teaching is a light. And then it says this, it says, correction and instruction are the way to life. Now, correction, man, isn't, that's an interesting word in our modern day era. Nobody likes to be corrected. But, but I really see correction kind of in two parts here. Part one is that we give our kids godly direction and then we give them room and freedom to try, but to give them that room to freedom to try means they might actually fail. I know as parents, we don't like that part, but isn't that what we're trying to grow them to? So that's the first part. And then the second part right behind that is we've got to allow them to experience, whether it's good or bad, the consequences of their decisions. That's what loving correction is all about. But we live in a day and age where parents will spend so much time and invest so much money trying to prevent their kid from ever making a mistake or at least ever feeling the mistake that they made. It's like we're holding them back. We don't want them to feel that loss. We don't want them to feel that discouragement. We don't want them to feel that disappointment. Listen to me. But when we do that, we actually cripple our kids. I love what Tim Elmore, he's a trainer, a leader, and also writes a lot for parenting. He, he gave this quote, look at this quote. Too much time is spent on trying to prepare the path for kids instead of preparing the kid for the path. It's like we don't want our kid to get hurt. We're gonna try to protect every variable. We're gonna try to make sure they succeed. And we're gonna over here trying to work this out when God says, no, you need to be working this out because you can't control the uncertainty that's gonna come. And how do they ever learn it if they don't learn it first with you at home? Can I just kind of declare some things? Come on. Our kids need a chance to try. Our kids need a chance to fail. They need a chance to fall. They need a chance to fear. They need a chance sometimes to fight through some things. And sometimes parents, in our love and protection, we're actually hurting you know what I believe? I believe God's trying to show us here that we gotta allow them to live with uncertainty from time to time. We gotta encourage delayed gratification in favor of a long-term goal. Come on, this generation doesn't know how to wait and they don't know how to work for something they really want. But I'm telling you, when you learn to wait and work, guess what? You sure appreciate it that much more. So my daughter, Sydney, wrecked a car. What does that mean? I don't got another car for you. 
You've got some savings. You better pick up some more shifts. She's been gunslinging chicken trying to make enough money. <laughs> this week, she pulled her own money out of her bank account. Guess what she did? She bought a nice little used Corolla. But you know what? She bought it. She's on the title, not me. Why? Because you got to realize sometimes we got to let kids earn. We got to let kids earn it instead of us just always giving it. And, and I thought about this tension, this idea of we got to not remove the challenge. It's too easy to give up. Listen, it's too easy to let our kids off the hook just because something's hard. But how do they ever learn endurance if they don't go through something hard? And the good news is they're still with you. They're still next to the lighthouse while they're with you. This is the chance to practice this. This is the chance to try this. Come on, don't excuse their behavior and don't, don't, don't remove their negative consequence. It's a chance for them to grow through it. Listen to me, adults. You know this already, but you forget it when you become a parent. It's in those moments of discomfort and correction that the greatest growth actually happens. And it's going to be tempting to step in. It's going to be tempting to pay the consequences for them. But when we do, we actually postpone their pain and we actually increase their future pain when we do it now. We got to allow the hardship now. Now, if I'm being too harsh here, let's just listen to Solomon's words. Proverbs 12.1, with this subject of parenting, he says this about discipline. Come on, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. That's actually the Bible. I didn't put that in there for provocative sake. It, it, that's actually the word. It's the word. Now, King James dresses it up, but that's the word. That's the word. Here we go. Proverbs 29, 17 says this. Discipline your children, and they will give you peace. They will bring you the delights that you desire. And talk about King James, old school King James. Come on. Proverbs 13, spore, spare the rod, spoil the child. Right? You ever heard that? Here it is. Whoever spares the rod hates their children. But the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. Now, the second point, if you notice that, I put loving correction, loving correction, loving correction. Love is a relationship word. And if you're going to correct, you gotta be in a relationship with who you're correcting. Listen, this verse right here is not licensed for us to be abusive. It is not licensed for physical abuse. And, and, and I'm telling you, the Bible calls parents to lovingly correct, and the correction is always born out of a relationship. Our kids don't need a helicopter parent hovering over and trying to over control and to attempt removing all the obstacles. No, our kids need a lighthouse. And what the lighthouse does, especially in the middle of the storm, it shines the light, it shines the light, and it shows the boats coming in where the rocks are. It shows the boats coming in where the danger is. It directs the way so that boat can come safely to shore. We gotta give our room. We gotta give our kids room. But we gotta lead them. We gotta lead them. And we gotta lovingly correct them. Come on, fathers, we gotta lovingly correct our kids so we can show them where they stand. That's the better way. That's the better way. All right, I wanna make sure you're with me. So here we go. Solomon gives us three things. What's the first thing? First thing is we got to what? Come on. Teach by example. Number one, teach by example. Number two, lovingly correct. Come on, you're not as confident with that one. Teach by example, lovingly correct. Number three, godly instruction. He says correction and instruction actually leads to the way. Right? Leads us to the way. I want you to see this. Light gives guidance and shows us the way forward. Our ability to give godly instruction though is always going to be linked to our own relationship with God. Hello. Hey men, it's Father's Day. As your pastor, I love you enough to give you some truth here. So I need you, I need you to think with me for a minute here. You wanna be able to give your kids godly advice? It comes back to your connection to God. You see that? 
I wonder right now if your kids actually know about your spiritual life, if your kids actually know about your faith. Have you ever opened up and had those conversations, even if it felt awkward, even if it felt weird, have you ever shared about how you began and how you continue a relationship with God and Jesus? Oh, pastor, come on, that's heavy on a Father's Day. Come on, pastor, ease up a little bit. Come on, pastor, right? Pastor, that's why we come to church. We're dry cleaners. We need you to tell us you're better at that, right? Listen, I would challenge you, even with the awkwardness of getting the words right, let your kids see your heart. And I'm telling you right now today, if you're a Christian, the best part of who you are is that you came to a point in your life and men, you realize that you're a sinner and you needed a savior. You realized you needed a savior and a Lord and you were humble enough. Come on, you were humble enough to say, I can't and to say, Jesus, you can and you did. And you put your faith and trust in Jesus. Can I tell you men, the most important thing about you Christian men is when you went from being self-centered to being Jesus-centered and now you have the opportunity to serve everyone around you. You need to tell your kids that story again and again and again until that awkwardness begins to smooth its way out. Because can I tell you something powerful about this? This today has more to do about your connection and your relationship with your heavenly father than it does anything else. And so what do we do? We want to guide. We want to guide our families forward. Week one, I looked at Proverbs 1 verse 7 and it said it starts with the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the beginning of knowledge. Hey, men, maybe that's the question. Do you fear the Lord? Do the people in your life know you fear the Lord? Is, is Jesus Lord? Is he Lord? Here's you a good verse. Come on, Proverbs 14, 26. It says, whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress and their children will see it as a refuge. That's a good tattoo verse right there. Come on, men. We're going to create such a faith that our kids know they can run back to the safe harbor of our lives. You see, we live in a culture, though, that prioritizes what? Happiness. And we got a lot of people trying to pursue happiness and are miserable. Can I just declare something to you today? Happiness is not a goal. It's a result. And when you try to make it the goal, you're going to keep chasing for the rest of your days here in this world. But when you put your eyes on Jesus and your heavenly father, oh, it's like a compass going to guide you. It's going to guide you and you're going to be able to lead in a place worth it. Or let me just get real, let me just get real personal. I apologize in advance for this one. But I want you to think about how much parents, how much time, money, and energy that you invest in your kid pursuing music or dance or art or sports, school, or all their social activities. And then I want you to ask the question, how much time, money, and energy do I put in to the spiritual development of my kids growing in their life and in their faith? I know that's unfair today on Father's Day, right? Because sometimes we think if I can just get my kids in all these things, and I'm not saying any of those things are wrong, but when they become the most important thing, the whole house falls. I wonder if we begin to make faith the priority, what that could do to everything else falling into place. But parents, we're called to what? To give godly counsel to shine light to show the way forward come on we got a verse that we always quote proverbs 22 6 says this what it says train up a child in the way they should go and even when they're old they will not turn from it i've had a lot of broken parents that have been claiming this verse because their kids are running in full rebellion away from god and i feel for parents when they're in those moments and I do believe that the power of this verse, but I'm wondering, is this verse a promise that's lockstep and never can be undone? Or is it more of a principle to live by? Because the things that are impressed upon our hearts are going to be the things that we impress upon our kids' hearts. Because how we live is what we really believe to be true. 
I'm going to call the worship team back up. And even as they come back into place, if you've been with us the last two weeks, we've been asking some so what's about this. You know, so what? And I love the, the truth that we're finding here and the wisdom we're finding here in Solomon's words. But, but Solomon, as we've already shown, is an imperfect man that God has inspired. And I do believe the word of God is that. It's God's words to us. But Solomon's words are true. They're just not enough because they're not complete. We need Solomon's words to lead us to what? The New Testament. And specifically, as I said last week, get to the New Testament to find the person, the person of Jesus. And so as we listen to what Solomon has said here, I want to share with you as I close out this message today, the words that Jesus shares that sound very close, but actually give us some deeper truth to what Solomon has spoken to us. Now, what I love about the words of Matthew chapter 28, because that's where we're going to turn in Matthew chapter, actually Matthew chapter five, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter five, as you turn there, I want to give you this context because Jesus is now speaking to believers. So if you're here today, if you're watching online today and you're a Christ follower, this word is for you. This is beyond just parents. This is beyond just dads. This word is for you. And I want you to hear these words. See what God says to us here. Look at this. Jesus said, Christian, church, you are the light of the world, a town built on a hill that cannot be hidden. And neither do you. Do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl? No, what do they do? Instead, they put the light on a stand and it gives light to everyone. Look at this. Everyone where? In the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may, what? See your good deeds and glorify, glorify who? Your Father in heaven. Come on. It don't get to be another greater Father's Day message than that. Come on. God's a good, good Father. We want to connect to our Heavenly Father. And Jesus is trying to show us, hey, Christians, hey, church, you're the light. You're the light. You're the light. You're to be a lighthouse. Why? So that people can see and so that people can see that God is our Heavenly Father. That's the whole reason Jesus came. That's the whole reason Jesus lived. That's the whole reason Jesus died on the cross. Why? So that he could help you. He could help me get right with my heavenly father. This is what this is all about. It's about our relationship with him. Now, this is interesting. You come to a Father's Day message and you realize today that you need to get right with the father. If it's for the first time, we call that salvation. It's again, we call that repentance. Is there anything between you and the Father that you need to make right today? Is it to trust Jesus as Lord and to begin? Or is it to trust Jesus as Lord and to be forgiven? God says, I want you here. Can, I want to talk to my men for a minute. Come on, men in the room. Men in the room. I got you right quick. I want to ask you this. Is your life worth following? That's what Solomon asked us today. Is your life worth following? Number two, as you correct, do you correct with love? Number three, are you given godly counsel, godly wisdom, godly advice because you're connected to the Father? Here's what I know to be true. Let me ask it this way. How is your relationship with your earthly father? And maybe you're sitting here today and your father has already passed away. But I want to ask you the question, how was your relationship with your earthly father? That imperfect man that played a role in your life as your father. Come on, was he one of the six? Or was your father a lighthouse for you? Because maybe you're sitting here today and you never connected the dots, but your earthly relationship with your earthly father, maybe it was a bad one. Maybe it was a distant one. Maybe it was a broken one. Maybe it was, it was a toxic one. I don't know, but if it was wrong, I wonder if that relationship with your earthly father has affected every other relationship in your life. You know how many times I sit with men that have been broken because their earthly relationship with their father was off. 
But I'm here to declare something true to you today that Jesus is declaring in Matthew 5 is that Jesus has come so that you and me and we can be right with the Heavenly Father. And when we get right with the Heavenly Father, that relationship can affect every relationship in my life. And for the first time, I don't have to use that broken earthly relationship as an excuse for not being the earthly father God's called me to be. Come on, who is that sermon for today? Who is this truth for today? We're all leading. We're all leading. The question is, are we following our heavenly father? Come on, I'm the father of four. I want to follow my heavenly father so I can be a better earthly father. Listen, the closer I walk with my heavenly father, the better I am in my, in my, in my behavior, my obedience, and even in my conviction when, when I'm breaking taillights. Listen, I want, to, I, want to, I want to walk close with him because when I'm following him, I'm worth following. Does, does that make sense today? And you know what? When we start to shine light, more people worship the father in heaven. And then what this is all about right now. So I'm gonna do something, come on, I don't normally do. I'm gonna ask my men to stand up. Come on, fathers, 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 stand up, stand up. If you're a father, stand up, stand up, stand up. I don't do this often, but I feel like today I just need to do this. Listen, fathers, fathers, there's pressure with being a father. There's weight with it, I get that. But we got a heavenly father. And what I love is in Matthew 5, he talks about this light. Do you know that if you follow into Matthew 6, the disciples said, Jesus, will you teach us how to pray? We see how you pray. We want to be able to pray like that. And so Jesus said, sure, I'll teach you a prayer. Come on, y'all know the most famous prayer, the Lord's Prayer? What's the first sentence in the Lord's Prayer? <laughs> Our what? Our what? Our what? Our Father who art in heaven right? When we position our lives with our heavenly father, that's a good position because all of a sudden, all of a sudden I'm getting, I'm getting in the right posture where I need to be. And so I thought, what example could we do today as we close out Father's Day? How about men? We pray the prayer today. We pray the prayer today over our lives, over our family's lives, and over the future of our home. And so can we just do this together? Can we just pray some Matthew 6 together? Come on, men. And if you're watching us online and you're sitting at home privately, don't be afraid to pray it out over your home right now. I think that could be a good thing right now. Come on. Here we go. Here we go. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Come on, amen, amen. Come on, everybody stand up. We're gonna sing about, we're gonna sing about putting it in the Father's hands. Let's let this word be more than lyrics. Let's let it be a prayer today that we're trusting and believing our good, good Father to help us light the way. Come on, let's sing.